right, John Scully, thank you very much for coming on to the boxingbar.com and welcome, my friend. Oh, thank you for having me. At the moment, I know you're in Dallas uh, for the fights uh, this weekend, but you're originally from the East Coast somewhere. How's everything over there with the pandemic and all this stuff going on in, in this world today? Um, you know, like it's good and it's bad. I mean, my gym in Hartford, we, we've been open the whole time. Uh, you know, we have to wear masks and everything, but we've been open the whole time. But in terms of, uh, you know, like I work with Better Beev and uh, he's fighting next Saturday in Russia, but I'm, I can't be there because of the travel ban. So, uh, it's affected me, uh, you know, in a pretty deep way, uh, as far as that goes. Yeah, and at the moment, uh, you know, how's he looking or what, what have you heard about him and, and what he's looking like and uh, what's he going to be like in the ring? I think a lot of people are excited to watch him uh, fight next week. Yeah, no, he, uh, I'm getting good reports, you know, as always. I mean, Arthur's, uh, he's a special fighter. You know, he's a special guy. Only, only, you know, one of the main reasons because he really, like, really takes his craft seriously. Like, he takes boxing seriously. It's his life. He's always in shape. He's always training. He's always focused. You know, he's never far away. Like when he comes to camp, he's within striking distance of his optimum condition at all times. So, uh, you know, it makes training him easier. I know as a head trainer, Mark Ramsey, uh, you know, he's in a beautiful situation because he doesn't have to spend the first half of the training camp getting the guy in shape because he's already in shape when he comes in. Yeah. It's kind of like the, like a dream thing there when, uh, when you don't have to worry about the person's discipline and all that stuff, and especially those guys, man, from Russia and all those uh, Eastern European type fighters, you know, man, they're very disciplined. That's one thing that their manager, the trainers, they don't have to worry about is their discipline. Right. Man. I mean, they yeah, fight. It's a they, different mentality. It's a different mentality in that part of the world, you know. Uh, and I've noticed that because I, you know, I know different guys over there, and uh, it is definitely a different. You know, American fighters could learn something from. Uh, from, you know, from, from different, not even that part of the world, but, uh, you know, Cuba, you know, fighters that come in from Cuba and different places, uh, you know, it's a different mentality. Uh, I've seen it firsthand, you know, so I'm not just saying it like guessing, but I've seen it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really something to see, um, you know, how other people treat their profession and their careers. Right. Where do you, uh, live at? Are you live in the Connecticut area, like where you were raised, uh, in that area? Over yeah. There? Yes, I'm in Connecticut. I, I had moved to Florida for a while, but uh, but I live in Connecticut right now. What was it like there growing up there as a kid? Um, Connecticut was, you know, where I was was um, it was a, a very racially diverse area. You know, my town was very racially diverse. Um, you know, which I, I think was a very good thing. Uh, like in my in my right in my immediate neighborhood neighbors, like my. People across the street, you know, we had a, a Jamaican family who's still there, actually, uh, a Jamaican family across the street. And uh, we had, you know, we had Asians in the neighborhood. We had uh, Indians. We had Hispanic people. Um, you know, it was it was really like a melting pot. Uh, it, was, it was good. It was, you know, middle, middle class upbringing, played little league baseball, and we played football in the park every day. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was good. It wasn't... Uh, it was a very, very much a middle class town. Probably about thirty-two thousand, I think the population was at the time. What was it like growing up there? Um, well, my, my mother and father got divorced when I was, uh, I believe, I was six. But uh, it didn't really feel like a broken home, only because my father he moved literally about a mile and a half away, and I saw him every day. Like, and I stayed with him on the weekends, but I would see him every day during the week. He would, he would actually take me to boxing. Uh, every day when I first started. So, um, he just did, it was like, it was like he just didn't sleep in the house, but he was there all the time. Um, you know, I, I grew up playing baseball. I played a lot of baseball, a lot of football, um, you know, like pickup games in, in the neighborhood and the park and things like that. Um, I actually started boxing in my neighborhood with other kids. Uh, we kind of had our own little boxing league and I started, you know, via that. I got into boxing watching fights with my father. My father was a big, big boxing fan. You know, he he actually had the first the first three boxing books, first three of the first books I ever read. Period. But the first three boxing books I ever read were actually his books, um, autobiographies of uh, uh, Willie Pep, Muhammad Ali, and Sugar Ray Robinson. So, you know, early on, I was I was very much exposed to the sport uh, through my father. Wow, man, those are three big, big names in the sport, especially Willie Pep. A lot of people don't talk about him, but man, he's uh. Well, Willie's from he's from Hartford. Now. Like he's the first 
he's the first famous boxer I ever met. He's actually the first professional boxer I ever met uh, was Willie oh. Pep. Um, and uh, uh, I was actually a pallbearer at his funeral. Um, wow. So I, uh, you know, I knew I knew Willie pretty well, believe it or not. And uh, a lot of people don't mention him when they talk about the greats of all time. Right. But uh, I mean, you know, when you when you, I mean, I mean, if he retired after 100 fights, <laughs> you know, he might be considered the greatest of all time. You know, even. You know, it's just phenomenal what he did Absolutely. and what he was able to do. You know, and, and I, I assume you know, you know, he was in a plane crash and he came mm-hmm. back and he was great after the plane crash. <laughs> and they told him he would never fight again, kind of like Vinny Pazienza. Right. He, you know, but he had a broken back. He actually broke his back mm-hmm. in a plane crash and he came back and fought and was great after that. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. And actually the only like big name that I really hear – they used to always bring him up uh, when he was uh, younger. Was Oscar De La Hoya? He, he loved Willie Pep. That was one of his uh, favorite all-time fighters. Listen, I'm going to tell you. I could tell you one of the greatest stories, right? Okay. I uh, I uh, in 19, I believe it was 1997. Uh, they called me and they said, "Look, uh, Oscar De La Hoya wants to have." Uh, Willie Pep come out to one of his fights. I forget which fight it was, but they wanted him out there because, you know, he, he really likes Willie Pep and he, he wants to, you know, have the boxing master there to teach him a few things and this and that, you know, and they were using it for a publicity stunt, I guess, you know, have Willie Pep there. So they wanted me to bring Willie to the airport. And uh, so I said, all right. So I go pick Willie up and, uh, now, Willie, you know, he's, he's an older guy and he's just, you know, he's just Willie. Like he's hanging around. He's just, he's doing his own thing. He doesn't, he didn't really watch fights. He didn't know much, you know what I mean? About the current state of the state of the game. Right. So we're talking on the, on the way to the airport and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, you're going to be with De La Hoya and everything. And, uh, so as he's, you know, I'm telling him like, yeah, it's good. And as I'm talking and he's talking, it occurred to me. He has no idea who Oscar De La Hoya is. He had no idea. And I'm like, because I said to him, I go, yeah, Oscar, you know, he's a pretty good puncher. He's pretty strong. And he goes, well, you know, if this guy's, you know, a puncher, like I'm, I'm a boxer. I don't know what they want me for. And, mm-hmm. and I'm like, man, he doesn't even know who Oscar is. And so I'm trying to tell him, like, yeah, you know, this guy is good. He won the Golden Glove. You know, he won the Olympics. He won this. And uh, so he was just going out there because, they told him to come out, and uh, wow. you know, so so it's like you know, it just and it occurred to me. I'm like, man, you know, it must be amazing to be so great and so legendary, where you're just kind of doing your own thing, and and uh, you know, gr- current greats look up to you, and and you don't even know who they are. Yeah, <laughs> it, was wow. just, uh, it, was just, it was just amusing to me, you know, and and there's not a knock on Oscar, like he didn't know who anybody was, like like Willie yeah. didn't know anything about the current day of boxing you know <laughs> and, and that's kind so. of how that old school was you know they they really stop you know even like now you know fighters from my you know when i was growing up they don't watch boxing today and it's kind of how it goes and we'll talk about a, l- a little bit about that in a little bit um but yeah that's an awesome story john and i know you have many of them and i know you have a book coming out and we'll talk about that in a little bit too and i'm sure you'll share a lot of those stories on there um yeah and and you, you said you, you had found out uh, boxing there fighting you know your buddies there on a uh, around the neighborhood and stuff like that. What was it like the first time you went in, in a boxing gym, you know, and saw that life? What was it like for you? You know, it, it, it's funny. I uh, The reason I went to a boxing gym, I, uh, you know, I used to pretend I was Muhammad Ali. That was like my thing. Like I would pretend I was Muhammad Ali and I would fight on, on the bed in my father's apartment. And, you know, I would just pretend I was, I was Ali fighting somebody. So when I went to the gym the first time, I went because... I wanted to pretend I was Muhammad Ali with those guys. You know what I mean? Like, I was just going to, you know, it was like going to like a like a play or something. And I went in, and it was a funny thing, and I still remember the kid's name. But I, I come in, I was 14 years old, and they put the gloves on me, and I sparred. And I sparred with a kid named Mark Sear. i never forget. And so I'm, you know, I'm just doing my Muhammad Ali thing. I'm on my toes, and I'm moving around, and... So after, you know, I did pretty good. Like he didn't, he didn't beat me up or anything and I didn't beat him up, but, uh, you know, I did all right. And so after he was like, uh, man, you know, how many fights you got or, you know, how long you been boxing? And I'm like, man, like 
15, 20 minutes. <laughs> I just started, you know, and he thought I was from like another gym or something. And I remember the trainer saying, you know, you got some natural skill. You know, if you stick with it, you might be able to, you might be able to do something. And, uh, you know, from that day forward, I, uh, I've been in the gym ever since. I never, never left. And you had a tremendous amateur career and we'll get to that right now, but you know, what was it like that starting that amateur career and going to all these different places and, and fighting these different guys and uh, competing to get to that top level? Um, you know, again, like, you know, my whole amateur career was uh, super, super exciting. You know, I treated it like I was a professional. Um, you know, I would, I would, uh, like, it was almost like, like, uh, still, like, like, like I was Muhammad Ali and, you know, I would, I would fight these guys and I would, you know, pretend that the fight, instead of being in the local boys club, I would pretend it was Madison Square Garden. And I would do, I would even do like post pre-fight interviews and uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff. And I even wore the red, the, the, the white trunks with the black stripe that Muhammad Ali always wore. Like that was my trunks. Those were my trunks. And, uh, you know, so I was just, uh, it was, it was kind of like, like just very, it was very, very fun to me. It was very, uh, you know, it was like, it was amazing to me that they let me do it, that they let me box, that they let me, you know, live out like a fantasy of being a fighter. And, uh, you know, I just kind of went with it. So, you know, and as an amateur, when I, uh, you know, when I was boxing and then I started getting my name in the paper, like I, my first, the first time my name was ever in the paper for boxing, I still have it. I actually have the article in my scrapbook and uh you know it was just so surreal to me to see my name in the paper and you know the more it was in there the more i wanted it to be in there and um so you know i just i was like living the dream pretty much during those 80s like the 87 88 you got pretty high in the in the ranks there and i believe i thought i heard you got to like the olympic trials at one point or something like that yes I, well I, well that was uh to be honest like when i first started as an amateur the, it was before the 84 Olympics. So I was reading about all these guys that were, you know, trying to make the 84 Olympics. And to do that, you had to go through the Olympic trials. So I was reading about Dennis Milton and Tyrell Biggs and Mark Breland and all these guys. So I realized, like, that was my goal. For 1988, I wanted to be in the Olympic trials the same way these guys did. So I would focus and go to all the tournaments that – that they went to the the Ohio State Fair, the National PAL, uh, things like that, and um, so it was just kind of like me just following in the footsteps, uh, you know, guys like like Mark Breland and I mean so many guys, Brown uh, Whitaker and Michael Grogan and so many names, Ronnie Yesid and Kevin Bryant and and uh, you know even even today, all these years later, a lot of those guys are are good friends of mine, which is. Uh, you know, which is really kind of surreal. It's kind of funny to me because I grew up reading about these guys and, you know, I still have all the articles and books and scrapbooks and boxes and, and, uh, now I'm friends with a lot of these guys and it's just, uh, it's really been a, really been, been funny to me. It's been, been amazing, uh, an amazing career, uh, for me. I've, I've gotten pretty much almost everything I, I've ever wanted out of it. Yeah. It's a real trip. I've seen you. I followed you, uh, through social media. And I've noticed on your pages, I mean, I see a lot of boxers, whether they be pro or, or of amateurs of, of back during that time. It seems like you're the go-to person for information. Yeah, well, you know what? I've always had a, had a very good memory for, for things I like, you know, and, and I really like boxing, obviously. So, so I have a very good memory. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you say photographic or, you know, what, what it is, but, uh, I do, I do notice uh, over the years that like, guys will call me and they'll be like, uh, man, well, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a perfect example. This happened about, this happened about two months ago. It was kind of, I even surprised myself, but, uh, Russ Amber, if you're familiar with Russ Amber, he owns, uh, rival boxing products. Oh, you see all the fighters, Lomachenko and oh, all those guys yeah, were yeah, rival, yeah. you know. Okay. So Russ is, Russ is a good friend of mine. So he was at, a, at one of the big fights. I think it was Canelo, the last, the, one of the last Canelo fights. So he calls me one day, right from the way in, and he goes, "Hey, Scully, listen, uh, I'm here with David Sample. You remember David Sample?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, from from Las Vegas." He goes, "All right, yeah, he was at the uh, the '88 Nationals, and he's trying to remember who he fought." So I'm like, "Yeah." I said, "Who?" I said, "What weight was he?" And he's like, "132." I said, uh, "I said, where was the guy from that he fought?" 
And he said, Michigan. I said, Kevin Childry. And I could hear, I could hear uh, David in the back go, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Kevin Childry. How did you know that? I said, I don't know. But that's who you fought. Kevin, you fought Kevin Childry. And I literally got it in one second. Like as soon as he said Michigan, I said, Kevin Childry. So I don't know how I knew that, but I just have this, you know, these memories up in my head. So guys, sometimes they call me to ask me questions like that. And uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of funny. It's kind of amusing, but uh, I like doing it. Yeah, see, and that's how I knew this is because I've seen it happen online and uh, this type of stuff. And people always ask you these uh, questions about their amateur career. And, and uh, do you remember this guy? What happened to this guy? And stuff like that. That's pretty cool. And at what point, do, what, at what point does a boxer know, uh, all right, it's time to, to uh, you know, step up and go into the big leagues, into the pros. At what point did you know it was time? Hey, you know what? It's Maybe I should try the pros. Uh, you know, when, do you, when does a boxer know, in other words? Um, well, I'll tell you, I was, I was different. I, um, I had not really planned to turn pro, believe it or not. I was going to stay amateur. I actually envisioned myself. I said, I'm going to win the Golden Gloves 10 years in a row. Like usually guys win, you know, two or three and I won, I won four, but I was saying to myself, I'm going to win it 10 years in a row. I'm going to stay amateur and I'm just going to go, I'm going to go all over the world and I'm going to travel with the U S team and I'm going to do this and that. But I remember reading a book uh, called um, uh, The Black Lights by Thomas Hauser. And in it, it was Billy Costello. If you remember Billy Costello, he was a world champion. Yeah. And he said that he, he was told, like, it's a good idea. Don't turn pro unless you can beat the number one amateur in your you know weight class. And, and I remember uh, I beat the number one and the number two in my weight class. And as an amateur, and I remember thinking, well, I don't know, it's kind of Billy Costello, and I, I made the comparison. And then, well, what really happened was, as I got bigger and I started winning bigger tournaments and different things, I, I, I got a lot of attention from the biggest promoter in our area, who really wanted me to go pro, and uh, he, he really. Uh, I guess you could say recruited me and he flew himself out to national tournaments and he really, you know, put the press on and, um, you know, I, I guess I liked what he, what he had to say and, and different people, uh, Petronelli brothers and Sugar Ray Leonard, they were, they were trying to get me to turn pro as well. So after the Olympic trials in 88, I guess it just kind of seemed like the, the logical, uh, next step. So I, um, so I went pro, but, uh, but I really, in, in a lot of ways, I, I really hadn't planned on it. Uh, if they didn't really pursue me, I might not have ever pursued it. But but uh, the push was on, and I, and I took the chance. Petronelli brothers, uh, you, are you talking about the Hagler handlers? Right, exactly. Because I used to, when I was an amateur, I used to drive up. My coach and I, we would go up and spar at, at Hagler's gym like once or twice a week. Oh, wow. Uh, I boxed with all kinds of guys. I boxed with Hagler's brother, Robbie, Robbie Sims, wow. uh, Stevie Collins. I used to box with Stevie Collins quite a bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was at Hagler's gym uh, pretty frequently back in those days. No way. You uh, you yeah. debuted on uh, September 1988. What was that pro debut like? Um, you know, it was like a, uh, it was like being in a movie. Like, like uh, when I first started boxing, like I say, I was trying to, pretend I was Muhammad Ali and, you know, I was in the gym and in a real ring. And now I was doing it in front of a huge crowd you know, and with TV and, you know, posters. And, you know, my name was on the marquee outside and, you know, it was really, really surreal. It was almost like a, like a dream. And, uh, you know, it was cool. It was, it was like being in a movie almost. And, uh, it was exciting. And, you know, I come out and there was a lot of people. We set the record that night for the Civic Center in terms of, uh, attendance for a fight. You know, I don't remember exactly how many, but, you know, there was a lot of people. And, uh, you know, the, the, the local media was really, really big on it. Uh, there was a lot of stories. And so it was, it was, it was very exciting. I mean, it was, uh, it was like a dream. It was very surreal, but, uh, but it was exciting for sure. You had a whole string of victories back to back, almost all of them except maybe one uh, by knockout. Then you fight a guy named uh, Brett Lally, and uh, right. you get your first loss. You know, for you, what was it like to get your your first loss? Were you in, in that depression mode, or was it about getting back up and you know right back on the horse? Uh, you know, to me, it was kind of like I was 
psychologically, I feel like I was kind of rushed. Like, like if you look at my record, I turned pro in September of 88, and I fought Brett Lally on ESPN in July of 89. So I was only a pro for nine months before I fought him, uh, which was, you know, kind of kind of crazy. Like, not, not too many people turn pro, <laughs> That's right. and then nine months later, they're in the main event on ESPN against a guy with 30 fights who's a rough pro. Yeah. Um, you know, realistically, I mean, not taking any way from him and not making excuses, but I was, I should have beat Brett Lally. I, I really should have. Like he was there for me to beat, but uh, you know, I, I, I it was a, it was a terrible time in terms of making weight. It was, you know, I shouldn't. There's no way I should have been at 160 at that time. That was that was a really bad mistake. Um, but uh, when I lost, the good thing my manager he uh, he didn't he didn't let me dwell on it. Like if you look at my record, I forget the dates, but I mean I fought. Right after that, as soon as I lost that fight, we came right back and I fought right. well, a month later or something. I don't know what it was. Uh, you know, I guess he didn't want me to lay around and, and think about it too much. Yeah, you did fight about five weeks later and, you know, you got right back on there. You got a little winning streak going. And down the line, you know, a couple of years up, you fight a, a, a guy named Tim Little who was 19 yeah. and 0 walking in there with you, USBA uh, title, super middleweight title on the line there. What was that fight like, man, with, uh, with Tim Little? Well, that that was on undercard of the first Holyfield Bowl fight. We were actually the the last fight before the Holyfield Bowl fight. So oh. that was a you know, that was a huge show. Oh, yeah. um, like like on the one hand, you know, I, I, Tim was very good. Like Tim, Tim was a great amateur. He was a world amateur champion and great prospect. And he had fast hands. I mean, he he was. He was a very complete package, you know. Uh, I, I I had a lot of trouble making the weight. Um, you know, it was really, really rough on me. Uh, I actually lost quite a bit more than I should once I got to Vegas. And just everything combined, you know, including his skill and, you know, all of that. Uh, it, it was it was a very tough fight. Um, and I got cut bad, like in three, four spots. I actually had four cuts. Uh, and I went to 12 rounds with the cuts. Um, but it was, it was very hard to see with the, you know, the blood goes in your eye and everything, um, you know, against a lesser opponent, I might've been able to overcome that, but you know, against someone like Tim Littles, uh, you know, that was very difficult. 1995, you fight a guy named Mi Michael Nunn. I just happened to watch that fight about three days ago. I was, uh, I knew I was <laughs> going to be talking to you. I go, let me throw on the Michael Nunn fight. And I actually remember it different than what I, when I saw it again. And what I remember when I saw it, I didn't. It was almost amazing to even see the uh, scorecards, um, you know, at, at the end there, uh, and how they how they judge that, and how you actually really did. Um, you right. know, I, I remember right. I remembered it uh, uh, totally different, and when I saw it, I actually thought that you know it was pretty. It was it could have been a draw even uh, or close to. Um, right. What do you remember about going into that fight? I, even the the commentators are saying that if you would have looked like that in any of the fights you, you previously lost, that you would have easily won looking at what the way you did. How, how prepared were you going into that fight against Michael Nunn? Uh, very much so. And it's funny you say that because I remember that. There was, I believe it was Al Bernstein. And, and, yeah. and in a way, it made me feel good. And in a way, I felt bad. But he's like, you know, if, if he would have just fought like this against Brett Lally, you know, he would have won. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I always knew that. But for him to say it, you know, realizing he knew it too, you know, it kind of made me feel bad. You know, I didn't, I didn't always reach my potential, but, but with Michael Nunn, I fought as well as I did because it was Michael Nunn, because I knew, you know, how great he was and how I couldn't leave any room for error. Like there was no slacking. I trained very hard. Um, you know, I was very ready. Uh, you know, Michael, he wasn't necessarily historically, he wasn't known as a puncher, you know, like Julian Jackson, but he knocked a lot of good fighters out. Juan Rodin, Curtis Parker, Sambu Colum Bay, yeah. Frank Tate, you know, he knocked out a lot of good guys. So I trained with that in mind. I said, you know, I'm going to get myself in psychologically, mentally, physically in such good shape that half the battle is going to be, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm not going to, he's not going to be able to hurt me, period. And uh, if that's the case, then I'm going to have a chance. And, uh, you know, I can honestly say I was never even, like, buzzed. I never was nothing. Like, like I didn't feel anything. I was very, very good shape. Um, 
you know, I, 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 it's, I didn't throw, he threw a lot more punches than I did, but I landed a lot more. Like, like I landed more punches at a much higher connect rate, but he was very busy. So I guess, you know, some people thought I won. Some people thought it was a draw. Some people, if I lost, I didn't lose, lose by that much. But I mean, either way, I guess it just depends on, it's one of those fights where it depends on what you're looking for, what kind of style you like. Right. You know, in other words, I could see how somebody could give it to me, and I could see how somebody could give it to him. So right, right. I can't, I'm not going to say I got robbed, but, uh, you know, I do think the judges, I mean, I don't know if it's incompetency or insanity, but, that, uh, <laughs> you know, that was not right. And actually, it's a funny thing, uh, regardless of who you thought won the fight, if you watch the fight, when they're reading the score, you can see my face, and I kind of, I almost like smile, and I, I kind of shake my head, because I knew after the first score, I knew exactly where it was going, and, you know, they made sure that I didn't win, you know, and it was just like they, they wrote in their scores before the fight even happened, so I don't even, in fights like that, I don't even pay attention to the scores, I, you know, it's it's like... There's certain fights in, in history. Uh, I don't. I don't even look at the scores. It doesn't matter what the scores. I know. I know what happened in the fight. Uh, you know Chavez and Whitaker. Yeah. Those those scores. You know, if you remember that fight. Oh yeah. You know, everybody saw what happened. They don't. They don't need to read those ridiculous scores to to know what happened. Yeah, that easily has to be one of the the, the worst uh, scorecards ever. The Whitaker. Right. Um, the Whitaker Chavez at the Alamo Dome in Texas. Uh, it was a pretty crazy scorecard. But, you know, I think what upset me, just even hearing the scorecards, I want to say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I want to say that the first scorecard or, or, or that judge had it like 120 to, to 108. And I was right. like, yeah, it, it was, was just, like, no insanity. way. There is no way. I mean, the 11th round, I want to say, during that 11th round, uh, not Al Bernstein, but the other guy. Uh, I mean, Bob Papa. Okay. Uh, but he his scorecard had you down by two points. Right. Know? I think going going into the uh, ninth round, I'm pretty sure Al Bernstein had it even. Mm. So, you know, it was that kind of fight. Yeah. And uh, you know, and, and that's you know, that's a that's a, a major issue with boxing is these these type of scorecards. Right. Like 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 I say, when I heard the first scorecard, I literally smiled because I said, "Wow, this this game is really something. Like this is like they're not going to give me any credit, you know, regardless of what happened." And, and I, I gave you credit because every time I think of Michael Nunn, I think of how he knocked out uh, uh Columbe, and I was like, oh, you know, right. I think of that knockout. That was a, a crazy knockout, and um, and you were in there phone boothing them and wanting to fight in that way, and and I, it's like you, you couldn't believe it. And the only the only thing I give him is the. Uh, but I think in the eleventh round, he started. Uh, he started doing his little old ways, and and and. But it was a little too late to start doing that in the eleventh round. So, you know, it was it was yeah. it was really interesting, man. It was really hard to believe that the judges did that to you for that one. You know. Yeah, boxing is. You know, we have we have our issues, and and that's one of them. That was a very weird. Uh, weird situation with, with the judging and uh you know i mean what can i say uh, I, I i know this my stuff for what it's worth i remember after the fight one of the judges is from rhode island his name was harold gomes uh and i didn't know much about him i guess he used to be a fighter and whatever i didn't know anything about him but i remember Vinny pazienza called me i forget how long after I don't know, it was a few days a week whatever it was and he's like oh man it was crazy scoring and blah blah and you know, who was the judges? And I said, Harold Gomes. And he stopped me and he went, oh, that explains it. <laughs> like, he, like he must have known this guy maybe wasn't that good of a judge or whatever the case may be. But he goes, oh, that explains it. <laughs> there you go. And so I don't know what that meant exactly, but then he didn't even need to hear me say anything else after I said that. Just a couple of fights up, you fight a, a big name there, Henry Maskaya in Germany. What was it like going up there fighting this guy at 29-0? and 0? Tough guy there. What do you remember about that fight? Yeah, I'll tell you, like, like, not an excuse. Just, just, you know, I was, I'm, I say there's not, not excuses. It's just factors, you know, factors. Uh, I wasn't going to beat Henry Maskey. I, I don't think. I mean, he was, you know, he was six foot four and a southpaw, and he was very, very well schooled. He was a very difficult fight. 
for anyone, like anyone in the world is going to have problems. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, at the time, my mother was dying. Like she, she actually died uh, four or five months after the fight. Um, she had cancer and, you know, we, so it, we went through the whole thing with that. So when, when, I, uh, when I left for the fight, she was basically on her deathbed, I guess you say. And one thing that happened when I left, the day I left, I always called home every morning, you know, to talk to her, you know, in the morning. And when I called home the day I was leaving for Germany, they said it was, it was the police answered the phone. They said, oh, your, your mother, they just took her to the hospital, emergency you know, in the ambulance, uh, you know, something happened. Whatever. So that's how I went to Germany, you know, not knowing what was going to what I was going to find out when I landed. So, you know, I had a lot of things on my mind. And, and, and uh, so, you know, it was just wasn't it wasn't the right time for me. But, you know, realistically, even at my best, I mean, he, he was a very tough fight. He was very, he was very well skilled. Um, you know, very good skills, very good height. He was a southpaw and the fans over there, it was impressive. Like they are, put it this way. I got there and my, my hotel was next to a mall and I went to the mall and, you know, they had a store there and they have like, uh, it was like a department store and they have, you know, you go into a store and they have beach towels and, you know, they might have Mickey Mouse on them or Superman or Wonder Woman on the towel hanging from the ceiling. So, and, uh, they had pictures of him on the towel, Henry Maskey. So I said, man, this guy, he's on the beach towels over here. You know, so him and Mickey Mouse are on the beach towels. So that's what I'm up against. And, uh, so, you know, it was a, it was a, you know, it was, a, it was a great experience. You know, I fought for the world title. Um, but, you know, the timing, the timing wasn't, optimum it wasn't ideal uh but with that said i mean i was i was gonna have problems with his style and his height i mean realistically to be honest with you i was probably more of a super middleweight overall uh my body frame i was probably best suited at 168 but you know making the weight was just hard and and you know i was probably probably in the wrong weight class you know ultimately but but uh you know i did, did what i could for that fight, it was for the IBF World Light uh, Heavyweight title. When you know that and you're going to fight for a world title, does that make you, you know, does that make you up your game a little bit? Does it kind of panic you a little bit? You know, what, what does that do for you knowing that you're going to fight for a world title? Well, you know, I'll tell you, it's funny. Like when I was a kid watching guys fight for world titles and I, you know, I always said, oh, it's going to be amazing. You know, I'm going to, you know, I pictured it a certain way. You know, I'm going to be in great shape and it's going to be great and we're going to go back and forth and, you know, all these different things. And then, you know, the reality of it is, you know, it's not like it's not like always you think it's going to be when you're a kid. It's not like in the movies, you know, uh, it wasn't the way I pictured it. You know, I wasn't uh, it wasn't nearly as much fun <laughs> as I thought it was going to be. You know, I was trying to get ready and, you know, my mother was sick and I'm, you know, I'm just thinking about her and you know, you're over there and everybody, I'm not going to say they hated me, but, you know, everybody there, 14,000 people, a whole country of people, they all wanted me to lose. And, uh, you know, I'm fighting this guy and he's a, he's a great fighter. He should probably be in the Hall of Fame by now. And he's an Olympic champion. And, um, you know, I just feel like, you know, he was the overwhelming favorite in terms of his promoter and, and all these, all these things. Everything was stacked against me. So, you know, I didn't, it, it was almost like it wasn't fair, you know, like, it, you know, it's just crazy. Like, uh, it just wasn't like I, I thought it was going to be when I was a kid. It wasn't as much necessarily fun. It wasn't as, uh, you know, the, the playing field was, you know, it's different when you're a pro. So I, uh, you know, I, I enjoy fighting for a world title and it was a surreal event and, you know, it's something that will always be with me. I was, you know, I can always say I was a world title challenger. Um, but just like I say, the timing of it just uh, definitely wasn't in my favor. The very next fight after that, which was in uh, 97 in uh, March, you fight uh, Graciano Rashi Gianni. They used to call him Rocky. They're at the Match Smelling Hall there again in Germany. Uh, I want to I want to say he won a lawsuit, didn't he, for against, against uh, Roy Jones or something because they they didn't fight or he he was uh he was due some money or something like that. Right. Well, no, I can I can actually tell you the story. He's, he's a former world. He was IBF super middleweight champion. Okay. Uh, very good fighter. You know, uh, we fought a good fight. You know, I just um, I lost a decision. Just you know, it is what it is. But uh, but I'll tell you what happened. 
He, I believe firmly, he is the reason, and I'll explain why, he's the reason that now they have all these WBC titles, all these crazy silver and, <laughs> you know, extra stuff. I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. Michael Nunn was supposed to fight Roy Jones for the title, WBC 175. Roy Jones vacated the title uh you know he 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 didn't he didn't want to fight michael nunn or whatever the case was but whatever the reason yeah he vacated the title so michael nunn and rachigani were set to fight for that wbc light heavyweight title nunn doesn't want to go over there obviously because going to germany you know you're not going to get the fight you know regardless so he goes over there by all reports he gets Rob, like Rachiani, you know, it's a close fight, but none should have got the fight, uh, but he doesn't get it. So Rachiani is the WBC champion. All of a sudden, a few months later, whatever it is, Roy comes back and says, okay, I want to fight again at 175. So they give him the title back. Jose Suleiman gives Roy the title back. So Rachiani's like, what are you talking about? I'm the WBC champ. Roy's got to fight me. And they said, no, 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 that was for the interim title. And but you guys, what are you, what are you insane? Are you crazy? What are you talking about? And they had all the, it was, it was never, not on a poster, not in an article, not in a press release. It was never called an interim title fight. So he sues, he wins. I believe it was $33 million. Yeah, that something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, if they give him that money, they go bankrupt. You know what I mean? The WBC is done. Mm-hmm. So the WBC said, look, we'll, we'll give you a lump sum and then we'll pay you a certain amount every year. Okay, he goes for the deal. That's when the WBC started to roll all these insane titles. They have to make sanction fee money to pay Ratsiana. And that, and if you look, that's that's when it started. Down the line, you know, you go ahead and retire after your fight in 2001. When does a boxer know, all right, that's it, man. It's time to uh, to call it a career and hang them up. You know, at what point did you know that that was it for you? Uh, well, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I did not want to retire, actually, at that time. My last fight for Cleveland Nelson in Toronto, it was one of the best fights of my career. Maybe maybe top, top three, probably top three or four. One of the best fights I ever fought. After the fight, I remember specifically being in the dressing room in the hall, in the hallway. And I remember thinking, this is, this is big. Like I'm back and, you know, I'm going to get some good fights and this and that. I'm going to be back on TV, the whole nine. Uh, fast forward like two years, I had nine fights in a row just fall out on me, just canceled. I was supposed to fight Elvin and Mariki at one point. I was supposed to fight different people and the fights were falling out for different reasons. So in the meantime, I started training Lawrence Claybay, the heavyweight. Because I was, you know, I was like, man, I got to do something. So I started training Claybay. I was going to fight and train Claybay. I get a fight in 2000, I believe it was 2003, and it was to fight Elvio Mariki. So I took the fight. I said, okay, yeah, great. Sign me up. Literally the next day, Claybay gets a fight for one day. It was either before or after. It was after my fight. So initially, I was like, okay, I'll just fight my fight. Then I'll go with Clay Bay the next day to his fight. But, you know, obviously I thought about it and it, it, that wasn't fair to him. There's no way I could fight and concentrate on him. And he, he's counting on me to be there for him as his trainer. So I, uh, you know, I made up my mind right there that, you know, I needed to be for him, there for him. And, and that's what I did. I, I stayed with Clay Bay and I started training fighters at that point. And how did you get the name Ice Band? Everybody knows you as the Ice Band, John Scully. How did you get that nickname? Uh, funny story. When I, nothing to do with boxing. Uh, I was a kid, and and I don't know what you call it where you live, but in my neighborhood we call it ranking. Like you mm-hmm. rank on somebody's head or their clothes, or you know. And so when I was a kid, the big thing was to uh, make fun of people's head. You know, you say, "Ah, oh, you big, you big rock head, you egg head, ah, oh, you big block head." Mm-hmm. So. They used to say that I had a square head. There's one particular kid, Albert Graham. He said I had a square head. So people started calling me square. Oh, hey, square. Hey, square. Hey, blockhead. You know. And when they went to my fights a couple times, uh, I actually have one of the fights on video back in 1985. And I can you can hear them in the audience saying, come on, come on, blockhead. Come on, ice block, ice block. And so they, they said my head was like a block of ice. And... 
it just grew from there, and next thing you know, I'm I'm the Ice Man. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty cool name. Um, yeah, you, yeah. You've been you've been in a training cast with different guys. Uh, from what I remember, I have uh, you know correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been in training camps with guys like Michael Nunn and uh, Vinny Paz and Roy Jones. What was it like to be in those type of camps? Um, I love it. The, the, you know, the best, I, I was never in camp with none. I was in camp with, uh, I mean, I used to go with Roy Jones quite a bit. I would go with James Tony. I would go with Vinny Pazienza mm. and for every fight. I would go, I went with Henry Mosky, uh, Charles Brewer. I went with a lot of guys. Um, it was, it was like a dream. I mean, I got the, you know, it was great because these are world champions and I got to box with these guys every day. So every day, you know, if I had a bad day on Monday, I could come back Tuesday or Wednesday and try to get it, get it back. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great. It was really great. I loved it every minute of it, uh, especially being in camp with James Tony. He, uh, James, James is on another level. We, we had so much fun outside of the ring, me and him and his, his friend, uh, there was Big Lou and Jimmy and, just uh, just really, really fun training camps. Um, those some of the best times of my life was being uh, in, in camp with all those guys. Was he around with uh, Jackie Kellen back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackie was one. Actually, the funny the thing is, I was at Roy uh, Roy Jones fought Percy Harris and James fought Doug DeWitt uh, in in Atlantic City, nineteen ninety two. I believe it was November hmm. and or December. And uh, I saw Jackie in the in the hotel gift shop. And I, I talked to her and I said, hey, listen, if you ever need sparring, here's my number. Give me a call. And uh, a couple months later, she called. And they had a fight coming up, and, and she called. And and then I ended up going. I went with them, I think, three times. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, just great experiences. You know, you get to, to box with someone at that level every day for weeks. You know, it's just, uh, you know, it doesn't get better than that. Literally, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, Jackie Cullen is an awesome lady. I had her on uh, last year sometime, and very cool lady, very very good stories that she has also. Um, you know, and actually you fought Tim Littles, and the first guy uh, after you fought uh, Tim Littles, the first guy to beat Tim Littles was uh, James Tony, I believe. Yeah, yeah, really. You know, I was watching that fight just the other day, as a matter of fact, and uh, if you remember, James was cut really bad in the fight. Mm. They were saying how they were going to stop the fight. They were going to give it one more round so on the one hand you know i give tim credit because he uh you know he was in the fight and he was he showed so much heart tim was like a he was like a like a pit bull like he right. was fighting really hard he was biting down he's fighting but james you know he did something really he didn't get the credit he really did something special it was like a movie like he was yeah. he was cut and tim was yeah, really hyped up right. and really excited and they told him they said listen we're going to give you one more round if you don't knock him out this round yeah you're going to lose and you're going to lose the title. And he knocked him out that round. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, that's a movie, you know, who could, who, who, you know, you dream about doing things like that. And, oh, yeah. and James did it. Yep. Yeah. James went out and did it. So, uh, you know, he did it in impressive, impressive fashion. And I always remember I have, I had that fight back in the day I, on a VHS tape. I had that fight. And when he fought out, when James Tony fought, uh, uh, Charles Prince Williams, and it was, you yeah. know, back to back, you know, like miracle, like knockouts that were just like amazing, you know, from James Tony. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Let me throw out a few uh, things at you there. I want to see what, what you got to say about them. Don King. Um, I'm not a fan in regards to what I, you know, things I know he's done, especially what he did with Ali after the Holmes fight. You know, he did, he was good for boxing. He put on some great fights, but uh, some things that I just can't excuse. Same day wins. That's a tough one. It's a tough one, and I'll tell you why. I speak for all fighters. Every fighter is going to tell you this. We're going to make the weight, whether it's the day before or the day of. We're still going to get down in weight. We're still going to go down to the lowest possible weight class, and we're going to, stupid or not, we're going to try and make it. And uh, so, you know, not giving the guys that at least a psychological you know, break where over at least they say, okay, I got a whole night. I can rest. I can, I can acclimate mentally to what I'm going through. Um, I did the same day way in when I fought Tony Thornton and I was making weight bad, you know, it was tough. And to have to fight that night psychologically, as much as physically, it was just not, not a, not the optimum situation. Going back to 15 rounds for championship fights. I would love that. I mean, here, here's the thing. 
people they talk about the old school, right? Where where guys fought seventy rounds, and they say, "Oh, guys today could never do that." I'm like, of course they could. What are you crazy? Of course you think these guys can't do that. Of course they could. They don't do it because they don't have to. They don't they don't fight sixty rounds anymore. But you know, the guys have been doing fifteen round fights for a hundred years before they stopped doing it, and they were doing it fine. Guys were. Uh, you know, there was a rash of, of there was a, a period there uh, during the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when a few guys were die, dying in the late round, you know, after getting stopped in the late rounds. And then Tex Cobb and Larry Holmes fought and, and Tex, you know, took a terrible beating for 15 rounds. And, you know, I guess that was kind of like the final straw for, for a lot of people. But it's professional boxing. It's professional fighting. 15 rounds definitely separates the men from the boys 100 percent. and uh you know if you want to be a professional you have to be a professional and a professional certainly is able to go 15 rounds how about drug testing when should it be done how should it be done do you do it prior to the fight be testing them every week you know what, what's your thing on that i mean here's the thing it, it seems very simple to me you test the guy uh the day before the fight and then you test him right after It'll either, you know, if, if he if he passes the one before the fight and then not after, that means they gave him something in the corner, and then you suspend him. If you, if you want to suspend him for life, if it's foolproof, then suspend him for life. We don't want drug cheats in in boxing. Uh, but it seems pretty simple to me. I don't know why. I don't, like a lot of people make make a you know it's like a difficult thing, and I just don't see how why it's difficult. You test him before the fight, you test him right after. He either passes or he fails. Period. If he fails, he's in huge trouble. And that's the problem. There's no, like they suspend the guy for six weeks. They're not going to, I mean, six months. They're not going to fight within six months anyway. You're not, you're doing nothing to them. You know, that would be like, you know, you know, you, you spend, suspend a baseball player for one night. You know, well, okay, he's going to play tomorrow. I mean, it, it, you got to, you know, I mean, six months. Guys don't fight in six months anyway. You're not doing, you're not hurting them at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, and here's the reality. Uh, if they wanted to really punish these, if they were really, and, I, and whenever this subject comes up, I always re- relate it to another professional sport, which is football, right? Years ago, 1992, there was a guy for the Pittsburgh Steelers named Steve Corson. Steve Corson was a, was a player on the, on all four of the Steelers Super Bowl championship teams, right? Me and him did a talk together at a school. Uh, he talked about whatever he did, and I talked about whatever I did. So I met him, and I saw man, you know, Steelers are my favorite team. So it was really cool to talk to him. And he told me, this is in 1992, he told me everyone in the NFL is on steroids. Everyone. He said, your favorite player is on steroids, period. And he said, guess what? In football, you can't be in the NFL and not be on steroids because you will die. You will get murdered. These guys will kill you with the, with the hits, the level of power they can get into these tackles. So when they don't catch everybody, they hardly catch anybody in the NFL. That's because they're not trying. Cause guess what? That's a billion dollar industry. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to catch the big stars and ruin the industry. They're yeah. not, you know, that would kill their sport. They're not doing that. They're letting, they are letting people use steroids. And I know another guy who was a college football player. He played for Oklahoma, right? The Sooners. He played with, I think, Brian Bosworth. He told me everybody in college is on. He said, you can't be in a D1 college school and not be on steroids. Are you kidding me? Now, this guy was a fighter later on. He fought at 168 pounds, right? right. He was only like 5'9". He said I I played at 220. He fought at 168. Wow. He played football like five years earlier at 220. And mm-hmm. once he got off the steroids, he lost all the weight. He was 168 pounds. So with that in mind, with you know, you look at Mark McGuire and and, and A Rod and all these guys. Yeah. You can't sit there and tell me tons of boxers aren't doing this yeah. i mean they are they of course i mean of course they are we're not you know we, we've got to stop being stupid we've got to stop being blind we got to punish these guys we got to catch these guys and we got to punish these guys yeah. uh, but people don't you know money money talk they don't want to lose these big paydays and uh you know and i think it's i think it's criminal i really do you know especially in boxing because i've sparred guys who i know were on steroids 
let me tell you, it is no fun boxing with these guys. These guys are hitting abnormally hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a different, you know, it's a psychological ad advantage for them. They become monsters because they believe that they're indestructible. It's not, it's not right. And, you know, you're talking about possibly killing somebody. I mean, I mean, what if, what if a guy gets killed? Now, back in the day, a lot of guys get killed. Willie Klassen and Charlie Newell and all these guys, right? What mm -hmm. if, what if one of them gets killed and then you do the test after and you find out the guy that killed them is on steroids? Well, does he go to jail for 30 years? I say, yeah, let's send him to prison. But I bet you, I bet you they won't. So something, something's wrong, and it's just like all the other issues in the world today. It's going to get worse. It's going to get really, really worse. And it's going to turn out to be where we can't even turn back. We can't control it anymore. Uh, hand wrapping. You know, uh, I think we, we've all seen that special with uh, Collins and Resto back in the 80s and Margarito doing that uh, what, against Sugar Shea Mosley or trying to. You know, what do you think of all this hand wrapping thing? You know, could it happen? Is it hard for it to happen? Is it easy for someone to do something like that? You know, what, what, your opinion. Um, it depends on the commissions. I mean, I'll be honest. I've been in dressing rooms in certain states where you could put knives in your gloves and these people wouldn't know you know they're not they're not on the ball they're not they're not dealing with the uh you know dealing with it properly uh but you know you would have to think i mean in the nevada is they're a very well-known commission they're very you know strict and you know it's hard to get get through but i guess in the case of uh you know with margarito i guess the hand wraps that he used i guess on the surface they look good it was, as, as, and this is, I could be wrong, but as I understand it, they had a thing where they wrap it and it looks normal. But then when he puts the glove on and then sweats, the sweat gets into the gloves and makes it, I mean, gets into the gauze and then makes it hard. So it's, it's not hard when he puts it on originally, but it gets hard over the course of a fight. That's, that's the way I understand it. Now that's criminal. If you're, if you're doing that, that's criminal. That's, that's, that's horrific. And that needs to be dealt with, um, you know, in the harshest of ways. Cause you know, if you, you know, if you've worn professional gloves before, especially Cleto Reyes, you understand this is no fun getting hit with these gloves anyway. Now you, yeah. imagine, imagine Julian Jackson wearing hand wraps with the plaster of Paris in it. Jeez. I mean, he already, he's a, he's a destroyer anyway. Yeah. Imagine he gets it. Then, you know, you're talking Julian Jackson. There's no doubt in my mind. He could, he could have killed somebody. No oh, yeah. doubt in my mind. Yep. And I'm talking dead, dead, you know, mm -hmm. six feet under, you know, these guys, uh, you know, that's why Panama Lewis, Panama Lewis, you know, he can, he's gone and people say, don't talk about the dead and whatever, but it is what it is. He did what he did. Uh, just because you die doesn't mean you get a pass. I mean, he, uh, you know, he, he's, you know, there's a lot of guys like Panama Lewis out there, and they're, they're not good people. They're not good for our sport at all. 